Hello, and thank you for clicking onto this video. My name is Erica Cater, and my colleagues are Connor Weisenberger, who you'll be hearing from later on in this video, and Dr. Mark Lewis, our professor at Trinity University. Today we'll be talking about our research on distributed ray tracing of larger scenes using SPARC. Let's start off with a little bit of background. We wanted to create a ray tracer capable of rendering images using geometry data from planetary rings. This data comes from other research Dr. Lewis has worked on regarding planetary ring dynamics. The problem was that we ran into hard memory limitations. On every computer, even with 32 gigs of RAM and other great specs, we couldn't render the full image. Each file contains over 2.3 million particles. Here's what one of those files alone looks like drawn out. This image shows the geometry, but involves no ray tracing. Now here's what that looks like with our render laid on top. Zooming in on our render just a bit, you can see how detailed and how many particles there are in this. This isn't even the entire 2.3 though, because the image is cropped. The full image with all of our files combined has over 46 million particles in it. Hopefully this and the render give you an idea of how big these files are and how difficult it is to render the full size image. Our goal was to create a ray tracer that gets around these hard memory limitations and is scalable. For this, we turn to Apache Spark. Spark describes itself as a lightning fast unified analy analytics engine for big data and machine learning. Spark provides a framework for distributed computing once a cluster is configured, you can submit jobs to it and it will partition and run them for you. Two major ways to use Spark are Spark SQL and RDDs. Spark SQL is good for data analytics, but writing a renderer in SQL didn't make a lot of sense in our case. Spark SQL is great when you are trying to leverage relational database optimizations in order to improve performance but our work required low-level memory control for general computations. Instead, we decided to use RDDs. RDDs are functional collections that can be partitioned across a cluster of machines without much work on the part of the developer. They are immutable, so we performed a lot of maps and folds, manipulating the data before finally retrieving it from the cluster. Hello everybody, my name is Connor Weisenberger and I'll be talking you through our approach to uh, creating a distributed ray tracer with Spark. Um, so the basic ray tracing algorithm is a kind of a three-step process. Uh, first, you create the rays from wherever your eye, you know, the source of your of your kind of camera is, and then send those rays out to every pixel and find out if they intersect with any geometry. Uh, that's step one. And then if there are any intersections with geometry, you want to find out if those points have been illuminated by light or if they are in shadow. And then you uh, kind of merge these two, the, the two first bullet points, and calculate an appropriate color for every pixel. And so that's kind of the uh, the abstract, you know, ray tracing algorithm at large. Obviously, you know, there, there are other ones like ray marching and other cool things like that, but that's not really what we're implementing here. Um, so we we kind of took an iterative design process uh, that that builds first from this kind of basic ray tracing algorithm and, and makes it easier to distribute, and then eventually distributes it. So I'll talk about uh, Renderer 1 first. So Renderer 1 uh, makes use of what's called a broadcast variable in Spark. Uh, broadcast variables are just variables that are sent out or, or that are readable by all the executors in the cluster, right? So that just means that every, every machine in our cluster has a full copy of the geometry which is obviously highly inefficient and not, uh, not, not really distributed, not in any meaningful way at least. It also leaves uh, the ray distribution up to the partitioner. This, this changes in future versions. Um, it's one of the keys to optimization. But uh, I mean, and, and this, this version works. It just is very limited. I think actually even more limited than a, a properly single-threaded ray tracer would be. Um, but here's a kind of a function map. You can see it's very simple of renderer one. We start off with, uh, you know, these kind of uh, these spark contacts point point vect vect rt image int 
uh, arguments, which are essentially meaningless. But you know that that contains information for the view and obviously Spark um, and, and just some information about where the camera is. And we pass all that into make rays, which makes a pix array for every pixel and puts that in an RDD. We transform those rays um, and we get back uh, an RDD of pixels and colors. And so essentially that transform step is just doing the first two bullet points we talked about earlier, which is just, you know, is, uh, is there a geometry somewhere along this array? If there is, is there light on that geometry? You know, and then rinse and repeat. Um, renderer 2, though, we, uh, we wanted to replace that kind of that, that transform function, which we were actually borrowing from SwiftViz2, another project of Dr. Lewis's. Because uh, it's, it's single-threaded and uh, doesn't really give us the kind of control that we need, uh, that we would like to have at least in future versions. Um, so we, we replaced this. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, the function map is a little bit longer now. Um, so we start off with, once again, kind of the same idea, just that view information of this spark context right here and all this stuff. Pass that into make rays. Make rays makes, you know, array for every pixel. And then we do uh, we do some the first this is the first round of intersections right here against geometries. And these are still using the broadcast variables for geometry. Um, but eventually that will change. Um, but so this uh, this intersect i function does intersections from the eye to the geometry. And then we get back this option of intersect data because it may or may not have hit. Uh, I think option is a Scala exclusive thing, but there might be other, um, I, I don't know, similar types in other languages. And we take those options uh, or that whole RDD and we pass it into explode light, explode lights, which basically just generates uh, rays from each geometry to each light to see if they should be illuminated or not. Um, and out of that function, we get this RDD of pixels, intersect data, and point lights, which is essentially just, uh, you know, the pixel location, kind of where the geometry is in relation to the camera, uh, and then intersect data, whether or not it hit, and then point light, you know, the color of that geometry, or the color of that light, which will become the color of the geometry if it is lit, right? And all that gets passed into calc light colors, which uh, essentially just produces this RDD of pixel RT color, which uh, we then pass into combined set colors, which, which generates our uh, our window. Um, and that, or I guess our image, more, more accurately. And that's Renderer 2, and it's all, you know, it's all great, but Renderer 3 is what we're, what we're really here to talk about. The primary improvement in Renderer 3 is that uh, we no longer use broadcast geometry. Uh, if you recall, broadcast geometry essentially sent out a full copy of the geometry to every machine in the cluster, which is incredibly space inefficient. Um, and so instead, what we do in Renderer 3 is we kind of split up split up the geometry somewhat intelligently uh, into KD trees, and we pass those, we create as many KD trees as we have machines in the cluster, and each sphere in the scene is only ever present on one uh, one machine in the cluster. Moving on to the function map, we start off with make in partitions rays, which is very similar to make rays, except for that it makes multiple copies of each ray. Uh, and we can see this this difference in the output. Uh, it generates this RDD of int to pixel ray. This int is the partition number, uh, and it gets passed into it gets passed along with the geometry into intersect i. Intersect i does the same thing it did before. Just finds intersections between uh, the rays and the geometry. We now pass the output of intersect i into this function called departition and find shortest, which uh, breaks all of the breaks all of the rays out of their separate part, separate machines and figures out which one of them is shortest per pixel and keeps that one. Uh, and that's obviously uh, a necessary step. Now that the you know rays aren't being checked against all of the geometry on a single machine anymore. It's now now they're being split up. So we need to find and make sure that we are keeping the shortest intersection. Or the, or the closest geometry is another way to phrase it, perhaps. Uh, and this gets passed into explode lights, which should look perhaps a little bit familiar. Um, different helper function, though. We pass uh, the output of explode lights into make raise two lights, which follows the same principle as before. Actually, these two functions right here are almost identical to 
uh, these, I guess, three functions from, from before implemented slightly differently, but essentially before we were making multiple copies of each ray for the geometries, now we're making doing the same thing, but instead of checking for collisions against geometries, we're checking for uh, collisions with lights. Or not collisions, but I guess the absence of collisions on the way to the lights. And once we've determined whether or not the light rays hit or geometry or not, we are going to uh, pass that intersect data or the option of intersect data into generate colors and then combine and set colors. And these functions behave very similarly to the way they've behaved before. They, they exist just to kind of combine all the data we have on the pixels and then map those pixels to our uh, J frame. It's also important to mention that other members of our research group are also at this conference presenting a paper on using Akka to solve the same problem, uh, distributed ray tracing instead of Spark. And we will be doing a, a comparison of Akka and Spark at the end of this presentation, uh, and I believe Erica will now present our results. So now we're going to talk about what we actually found throughout our research. Quick reminder to how many particles are in each panel. Each panel has over 2.3 million particles in it, which makes each file really big. Trying and failing to render these files is what motivated our research in the first place. Our program has two phases, loading and rendering. Loading times vary considerably due to file sizes and network configuration, and while they could be long, they ultimately have no bearing on our research and have thus been excluded from our results. Our research focuses on the rendering stage. The rendering stage is more controlled and it's what we try to evolve with each new version of our renderers. All time results shown are averages over multiple runs with a standard deviation that tended to be between 5 and 10%. Here's an example of one of our renders. This is a single panel zoomed in a little bit. There is a white light off to the right and a yellow light on the left side. Um, this probably will be a little bit easier to tell if you focus on the larger particle in the center. This is called a moonlit. Here's an example of two panels side by side and zoomed in a little bit. Hopefully the detail is showing up, but all of the colors and shadows went through a bunch of different calculations um, to really configure the proper shadow, the proper yellow, the proper intensity of color um, due to the geometry. So this is what that looks like. For our testing, we use two clusters, the Janus cluster and the Pandora cluster. The Janus cluster includes 20 computers in a regularly used Trinity University classroom. These computers are a little bit older, they're regularly used for homework, tutoring, and class, and they are fairly average. By contrast, the Pandora cluster is a specialized group of computers, all on a rack together, they sit a few inches apart with a dedicated server and are only used for Spark clusters. Uh, these have improved specs such as more core, more RAM, and improved processor, and generally we were the only ones using them during our testing. Before trying to distribute the geometry, we performed some baseline stress testing on single computers. The most important figure here is DNF, this stands for did not finish. We found that the Janus machine could not render more than 20 scenes without the program crashing, while the Pandora machine made it to about 45. Other than that, we can see there's not much difference between either. Um, the times are fairly comparable and seem to get more efficient until hitting a hard limit. This is because the panels are thin and tall with a 10 to 1 aspect ratio. So when there are more than 10 panels, there's actually blank space above and below the geometry. This is processed very quickly by the KD trees because this means a lot of rays missed and so there's not a lot of calculations that need to be done at that point. As for our early findings, this is when we were testing renderer one and two. They are not great, but there was progress between them and they were a vital step for creating our distributive geometry renderer known as renderer three. So here are the results. Uh, these results were run on a Pandora cluster. As you can see, they fail to render very many panels. Um, they are distributed in that they run on a cluster, but the geometry is broadcasted to all of the computers on both of them. So there's a lot of overhead and they crashed very, very fairly quickly. Um, but they were 
definitely a needed step to get to our ultimate goal, which is renderer three. So finally, we got to test renderer three. Um, our goal here was not really speed, but rather to render scenes larger than an individual machine could handle by themselves. For us, this means the ability to render all 60 of our files. As you can see, we reached that goal. Both clusters successfully rendered all 60 panels. It's clear this renderer is not the best for smaller scenes, but more suited to rendering larger ones. This is particularly because Renderer 3 forces the clusters to use, to use a smaller number of partitions. Uh, so smaller number of files, smaller partitions, makes it fairly inefficient in this case. Um, the ability to render 60 different panels is a real sign that this work is successful as individual Janus machines couldn't render more than 20 on their own, and even the Pandora machines with the larger memory could only go up to 45 cells. And this is better than our preliminary results, which with renderer one and two, which were using a cluster, but couldn't handle all of the geometry. So these are our findings. Thank you. Hello, it's Connor back with the conclusion of future work section. Uh, you know, we had some very promising results uh, we were able to render more geometry with distribution than we ever could on a single machine, and that's kind of our, that was our goal. So we, you know, we met that goal. We officially proved that Spark can can be used for something like this. Um, and our code was very compact. Uh, you know, it was sub 200 lines in Renderer 3, which is, which was our final version, um, and and that has some advantages for sure. Uh, we can see, compared to Akka, the Spark solution was easier to implement but offers less fine-grained control. Uh, the Spark solution, though, importantly, is also resilient, which means that if you were doing a very long co uh, computation and you had a machine go down, the Spark solution would continue working and hopefully, uh, theoretically at least, give you back the correct answer or the correct image, whereas the Akka version probably wouldn't do that without some additional, additional work on behalf of the programmer. Uh, we can see a graph here of Spark against a couple different uh, Akka variations um, in terms of how long it takes to, to render scenes with certain numbers of files. Um, so we see that you know sub 16 files, it's just absolutely not not worth using Spark. But but as you as the number of files increases, Spark becomes more reasonable. Uh, we see it's it's still not quite on the level of Akka sum and Akka few, uh, but it's also much easier to implement than Akka sum and Akka few. Uh, and it's also resilient out of the box. So I mean, theoretically, if you were doing a computation with say, uh, you know, a thousand files on a huge cluster, you know, and you had a 0.1% machine failure rate, Spark could actually be faster than uh, Akka sum or Akka few, just because it's resilient. Uh, but that's not to say that it's necessarily better than Akka all the time. Akka definitely does offer you more fine-grained control, and if you're willing to put in the extra work, I think it's a strong choice. Um, as far as future work is concerned, uh, we, we used physical clusters. Uh, we could also, you know, in theory, integrate this with uh, like a Google Cloud cluster or an Amazon Web Services cluster, uh, and that would be, you know, an interesting experiment, I guess, just to see uh, what what file sizes or what what numbers of files we can get up to with with a larger cluster. We're also considering a photometric ray tracer as future work. I believe this is what I'll be doing my thesis on. Uh, next year, so uh, stay tuned, I suppose. Um, all right, well, that's the presentation. Thank you for watching. Uh, Eric and I would like to thank Dr. Lewis, uh, Trinity University, and Trinity University's Department of Computer Science uh, for allowing us to do this research. Uh, once again, thank you for watching.